agrees with our visual interpretation. So let's take a look then at chemical compound effects, C. If I use A, that's coded as Xc is equal to minus 1. And if I'm using B, that's coded as Xc is equal to plus 1. So bringing that, that factor in, or sorry, that, that this choice in, we say here visually we would prefer to use A. So that's a code of minus 1 for Xc. Minus 1 substituted in here multiplied by a positive slope coefficient is going to reduce y for us. So the linear model agrees with my visual interpretation. In terms of the temperature effect, the slope coefficient here of 0.75 is a much smaller slope coefficient than either the constant uh, than this, the C effect, the chemical effect, or due to the stereoscopy effect. So the magnitude of these coefficients are very high in the case of the temperature effect. That gives me an indication that changing temperature will only marginally affect Y. That's the whole purpose of today's class is investigating that, these relative effects and understanding why we can do this. We cannot normally do this in these stress models, but for DOE models, we can absolutely compare coefficients. We'll see in a minute why. The two-factor interaction of CT and TS are also numerically small, so we can ignore those. Here's the interesting coefficient, the minus 6.75. Cs times, for Xc I should say, the, the code for the chemical compound multiplied by the stirring speed. So we'd said there earlier, so we should use chemical compound A. I glossed over the stirring speed effect. Does the stirring speed coefficient match our intuition from what we saw visually? Should we operate at high speed or low speed? What does high speed imply? Excess is going to be positive at high speed. At low speed, excess is going to be negative. The reason for that is because excess, as we saw in the previous class, or for any coded variable in fact in DOE, is it's the deviation from baseline divided by the half range. So let's go back here. In standard form, my variables coded as minus ones and plus ones is the variable's value minus the center point. So it's the actual speed minus the midpoint divided by half the range. Well, in our experiments, this corresponds to the midpoint would be 300 divided by half the range, the range is 400 minus 200 over 2. Okay, so at high speed, the implication of high speed means you're operating anywhere that's above the midpoint. Above the midpoint would be anything above 300. So 400 is a high speed, 500 would be a high speed. Anything that gives excess a positive value that would be considered a high speed. So if we go back to our least squares model, by substituting a positive xs value here, I'm multiplying it by a negative coefficient, that's going to serve to decrease y as well. So both using chemical compound A, that will reduce y from the baseline case. Okay, the baseline case is going to give me 11.25 month gluten discharge. Why is that? Why can I say that? Okay, at the baseline case, the midpoint of that cube, you cannot actually run that experiment, but an experiment here at the midpoint of the cube should give me a yield, uh, sorry, a Y of pollutants of 11.25 pounds. Can I actually run an experiment at the midpoint in this particular situation? Generally not. When you've got categorical variables involved, you cannot. If they were all continuous variables, I could run an experiment at the midpoint. Sometimes you can. Sometimes we can blend half A and half B. So take a mixture of these two materials 
and, and, and run a blended experiment at the middle, but you have to be careful there because there may be interaction then due to those two raw materials. But in general, for continuous variables, we can run a center point. And the y I expected the center point is this value of the intercept. Then in addition to that, I get these modifications. So xc, the, the chemical, if I use chemical A, it will reduce it by 6.25 units. And if I use high stir speed, I'm going to reduce it by an additional unit. What is that interaction term doing? Let's come back to this term now. So we've said to use xc equals minus 1. And I've said to use high speed, so xs is going to be positive. What's going to happen with my interaction? I'm going to put a negative, multiply by a positive, <coughs> multiply by a negative. I'm going to get a positive coming out of that. It's going to serve to bump my pollutant back up again. Here the interaction term is working against me. Okay. In many instances our interactions work with us and promote our objective or enhance our objective. Here unfortunately, from the main effects, the main effect for C is telling me to use chemical A. The main effect for stirring speed is telling me to use high stirring speed, but the interaction is going to counteract that effect. Okay? So it's not an obvious choice in this case what to do. Let's presume we go use plus one yes, and minus one. So let me assume that I'm using plus one for xs. So that will correspond to stirring speed of 400. Let me assume I'm using chemical A, so that will be xc equals minus one. In this particular situation, minus one plus one multiplied gives me a minus 6.75. This is going to increase by, by 6.75 units. But I'm going to get a 6.25 decrease by using chemical compound A, and I'm going to get a 7 unit decrease by using high stir speed. So it's minus 6, minus 7, that's minus 13, but then I add 6 back. I'm still better off than what I was previously. Okay, so in this case, yes, the interaction counteracts me, but the two main effects are still stronger than the interaction itself. So I'm still better off using those desired, uh, using chemical A and using higher speeds. Okay, so interactions are a little hard to work with. They take a bit of getting used to, but they're quite easy to interpret and fairly straightforward once you get the hang of it. Let's take a look at how you would do this in software. We, we did that last time. So I'll just uh, run that code again. We had the full model created and we, we, we showed the coefficients here. In summary, so if you write the summary of the model, you get exactly those coefficients that we saw up there earlier for interpreting. Today's class, we're going to look at judging whether each factor is significant or not. One way to do that is I'll just jump ahead on these two slides and I'll come back to them. But the easiest way to judge the significance of the effect is to plot a bar plot of the coefficients. So here I've done for another example. This is for a 2 by 4 factorial. So there's 16 experiments. 16 experiments, I can estimate 16 parameters. This bar plot looks a little bit different to the one in your notes. And the reason is I've, I found a better code to show what's going on here. So in your, in your notes, you have just a, a grayscale plot of the bars. What we can do is we can add a little bit more information to that plot with the color. What I've done then is I've sorted the bars from low to high magnitude. Low to high absolute magnitude. So whether it's a negative or a positive, I take the absolute value and sort from low to high, and I show that as a bar plot. Almost in every experimental design you'll see, you'll see some sort of elbow or a point where there's diminishing returns. So very seldom that you'll see a smooth sort of triangular look here. It will almost always be that about 30% of the coefficients are significant and high, and the rest are small and convenient. Okay, so in this case, for this particular experiment, 
the main effect A, the main effect T, and the main effect C are significant. The fact that they're orange bars indicates that they're positive sign. The A, C, and A, D, two factor interactions are significant and they're negative sign. But all these other terms are pretty small. They have very small effect on Y. Let's go back to this example we're dealing with here and generate the same plot. If I go back to R now, and I this code is on the website, so it's, um, it looks pretty messy, but to, to plot these color-coded bar plots, just copy and paste this code to the website and use it in your own projects and work. So if I run that now, I would get a plot that looks something like this. So it's telling me my, my stirring speed effect is definitely significant, and it's got a positive and a negative coefficient. It's telling me my C effect, the choice of chemical compound, is significant, and it's got a positive effect. The CS interaction is significant, and it's got a negative coefficient, which we saw earlier. The temperature effect is small, much, much smaller relative to these three, uh, relative to C and S and the CS interaction. So temperature is immediately a term that I recognize as being insensitive in my system. So is the temperature stirring speed interaction, the C temperature interaction, and then the three factor CTS interaction. Very, very common that you find your three factor and higher factor interactions to be very small. Most engineering processes will almost never observe three factor interactions that are important. I've, I've certainly seldom, I've, one experiment I've seen that, and it was almost written by design, but CTS is never, or, or three-factor interaction are almost never important. Two factors definitely, main effects, or main factors definitely. So this then takes us to the next step. Well, if temperature is not significant, nor are its interactions, can I delete temperature from my model? And if I can delete temperature from my model, that's going to free up degrees of freedom to estimate confidence intervals. Because right now, one point where I'm stuck at is I'm not able to judge whether things are significant or not from, a, from a just a pure least squares point of view. So the way to proceed is as follows. Go to the bottom of this chart, and here I've got a CTS interaction. Let's delete the CTS interaction and see what happens to my degrees of freedom and my standard error. Then I'll, I'll work up the chart deleting effects. So let's go back to the code then. And we'll show that. In my model now, if I go summary mod, I see I've got no residual error and no degrees of freedom. But what if I take this model now, and that's the model I used earlier. Let me go remove that three-factor interaction. So I don't need to estimate the CTS term anymore. So let's call this model.sub, it's a subset of the original model, and I can go run that code and it will generate the model. I now have one degree of freedom because I've estimated <coughs> one fewer parameter, and my standard error is 0.7, my R squared is still, still high. What's more interesting for me is the confidence intervals. Now I can estimate confidence intervals to some extent. So I still find my concentration term to be significant, both both span are both as positive. My temperature effect spans zero. So temperature is not significant. See, the S coefficient is significant, both are negative. And then the temperature interaction C T spans zero. The C S interaction is significant, and then the T S interaction spans zero. So it's really confirming that, again, the CTS is not significant. Now my next step is to go up here. Let me delete these two factor interactions, TS and CT. So I work from the bottom up, and I'm going to remove those three together now. I don't need them anymore. I'm claiming that they're not significant. So I go back to this code up here, and I said TS is not significant, and CT is not significant. So now I'm going to estimate one, two, three, four effects plus an intercept. So five parameters, you're going to have three degrees of freedom left. Let's 
Let's verify that. So if I run the, run the model now, three degrees of freedom, I've only estimated these five parameters. I hit the intercept, the CTS main effects, and then the CS interaction. And taking the confidence interval on, the, on that model proves again to be the intercept. We always ignore the intercept. But the C effect is still significant. The T effect is now got a confidence interval that does include zero, but only somewhat, a, or not only, but it's asymmetrical. So minus 0 0.04 and plus 1.5. So there's asymmetry on that temperature effect. Statistically, it's insignificant, but there is a bit of asymmetry there. The S effect is statistically significant, and strongly so, and so is the CS effect. Do I delete the temperature effect or do I keep it in? In other words, I'm saying, do I keep going up and up this bar plot, deleting, 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 or do, where do I stop? Okay, there's no right answer here. I could delete the temperature effect, and I'll free up an additional degree of freedom. And if I run my confidence intervals, I'll find all this remaining coefficients are all statistically significant. But temperature is a main effect. My preference is to delete main effects as a last resort. But not, not entirely so. If the temperature's confidence interval spans zero roughly symmetrically, absolutely, go take it out. But the fact that it's fairly in asymmetric probably means that it's, it's kind of important. Maybe I just haven't varied my temperature range over wide enough. So I've gone from 72 here to 100. Maybe if I had done my experiments originally, going from 65 to 105, I would have started to see a temperature effect. I just haven't perturbed that variable far enough. Okay, so here my concern isn't so much that it's statistically insignificant, it's more that have I done my experiments over a wide enough range. Uh, what if that temperature was like categorical variable? A good point. If it's a categorical variable, then you, are, you obviously can't say that. There's going to expand the effect. Then I would still leave it in because I, it's still giving me some guidance when I'm looking at my least squares model where I'm going to choose to run my next experiment. Even though it may not be statistically significant, there may be some very small incremental effect from it. And at least I'd rather know that than not know it at all. Okay, so the moment you delete something out of the model, you have no more knowledge of it. So here, my preference is to march up from bottom to top, deleting out two and three factor interactions. When I get to a main effect, I hesitate, and I, I, I make a judgment. And this is a good example of that. So, coming back to the notes then, when we say we want to estimate confidence intervals, there's really two ways of doing it. One way is the method I just showed you, where we drop out factors, and we refit the model with those factors dropped out. Another approach that people sometimes implement, but it is short-sighted, is to go run replicate experiments. Now, a replicate experiment is expensive. It says go repeat the experiment all the way from the beginning to the end to get a one extra data point. Let's take a look back at Emily's experiments when she was baking muffins. A replicate experiment in Emily's case is go all the way back, mix new ingredients, mix them up, put them in your oven, bake them, and then measure your Y variable. A replicate experiment is not let me go run my experiment and measure the same Y from three or four different samples from the same experiment. That's not a replicate. A replicate means you have to redo the entire experiment from scratch and preferably at some other points in the future, not back to back. So a true replicate means you have to review everything. So don't think that, okay, I can just measure my Y variable a second time from the same batch of experiments that you ran. That's not a replicate. All that's measuring is your reproducibility of your measurements. Okay, so we will learn that fractional factorials are a far better way to spend your experimental budget. If you need to do replicates, then you're almost always doing something wrong, especially if it's near the beginning of your experiment. Rather spend your budget on investigating extra factors 
what you'll find then is that you'll find some of your factors are not significant. You'll drop them out and you'll get your degrees of freedom anyway for free. So rather than wasting your budget on repeating an experiment to get degrees of freedom, you will probably find that, well, hang on, instead of investigating three factors, that's a two to the three factorial, that's eight experiments. Well, some people will say, well, I'm going to repeat all eight experiments a second time. That's 16 experiments that you've done. Well, a better strategy is the following. Rather go investigate four factors, you'll still do 16 experiments, but you'll likely find that one or two of those factors are not significant, and you'll get the same, you'll get degrees of freedom anyway. Okay, so we'll see that and cover that more in the, in the next class, where we look at fractional factors. So those are the two strategies, almost always the better one is to fit as many factors as you possibly can into your budget and then go drop on factors later on. So what these slides over here show, and I, I would encourage you to go through them, is that they illustrate how we get degrees of freedom if you do run a replica class. But again, as I've emphasized here, my preference is that you do not go and do my, my preference is that you go uh, add more factors to your experiments. The final, uh, one, final point, I, I jumped over those two earlier slides. I do want to recap that because I find this is important to understand. We'll just end the class here. When you gone and run experiments in the past in high school or in your university labs, you change one variable at a time. That's almost always how every experiment in the lab is run. You go at some base point and you go investigate the effect of temperature, you go increase temperature, you decrease it, whichever way around it is. Then you go back to your original point and you go change the second variable up and down. And you go investigate the, that S effect. So you've done three experiments, and you independently can judge the S effect, and you can independently judge the temperature effect. Well, we've looked at that, and we've said that that's inefficient. You're only getting one estimate of temperature, and you're only getting one estimate of S. You can rescue these bad designs. You can rescue them by go filling a fourth data point up here. Go running a fourth experiment at that combination. And you re recover the full factorial, now you get two estimates of temperature and two estimates of S, and you compute the average of that. The average of those two experiments would be a far better estimate of the effect than the individual. Okay, so we can almost always rescue that. Same for this guy that I showed you in the earlier in the first class. We started this base case and we moved horizontally, then we moved vertically. Well, if I realize that this is a bad strategy, I don't have to throw this data away. This is still extremely valuable and fully expensive data to acquire. What I can do is run one more experiment over here. So some experiment around that point, and I'll recover the full factorial in the two factors. So almost always you can go undo the mess of someone who's not so so okay, And it will, it will happen. We'll go work in companies where some other engineers and scientists have run experiments naively almost always you can recover a tremendous amount of work done by just doing one or two more incremental experiments and fixing up the mess and getting a clearer picture of what's going on. So key points from today's class, we can fix up bad designs. The second main point in today's class is standard error needs to be estimated if we want to get into confidence intervals. So in general, a full factorial gets you a standard error of zero. That's not too useful for any confidence intervals. Well, one way to get that standard error not zero is to go delete factors from your experiment. The easiest way to do that is to use the Perino part over here. The code is on the course website. And we start from the bottom to the top. So let's end this class with an example coming back to this guy. My first strategy would be to delete the A, B, C, D, four factor interaction. I would also go delete the three factor interactions of A, C, D, A, B, C, and B, C. Those are likely insignificant. So I'd free up one, two, three, four degrees of freedom. I'd then go at that point rebuild my model and see what the confidence intervals are. When I rebuild my model, 
these bars here that are that were shipped previously, those locations do not shift. The, the bar sign and magnitude doesn't change if you're going to delete coefficients from the model. That's very important to understand. Think about what x transpose x, x transpose y is doing here. Your data isn't changing, so you're not going to estimate the second time round with different values. You're going to estimate the same values. So the second time round I do this, I will still find a, b to be my smallest bar down here. And I will get an accurate confidence interval for it. Now I can go delete a, b, b, d, c, d, and b, c. This is where I'm going to hesitate. Do I keep factor b or not? Well, it totally depends on the data. What is the confidence interval for factor b this main effect look like? Is it span zero symmetrically or not? That's going to be my guidance on whether I delete B or keep it in the model. Another very important point to note here is that let's say I've got AC as being an important two-factor interaction. Imagine that factor C was not significant. So let's imagine that C's bar was very short and somewhere down here. It is not correct to go delete C. If you have a two-factor interaction, AC in this example that is significant, you must retain the A main effect and the C main effect in your model. Even if the main effect is small, you cannot go it because it's not fair to get the two-factor interaction that itself that is significant but you can delete it one of its main effects. So if you fit a model with a two-factor interaction, you better be sure to include the main effect of the two variables in your model in addition to the Okay, so that's uh, that's covered here on the slide down here where I talk about P and Q. So I'll just end off over there. Yeah, so this is the something. Okay, here it is. Okay, so main effects cannot be interpreted separate from the interaction. So if the P Q effect is significant, I have to retain the Q and the P effect in the model. I can't go to these. <laughs> Okay, so I'll end the class here a little earlier. We'll resume on with blocking and compounding.